I thought that it was time for me to explain a couple things about the Bible versus the Quran. But I was on the Santilli show the other night, and as a matter of fact, the link on that is below. But I realized that people really don't understand what's going on, not just the millennials of today, and I'm talking about the generation coming up that, you know, have their headphones on and aren't listening to anything else in the world, that think political correctness, worrying more about Mexican food being served at a university, uh, is, is, is more of a, a, like, a horrible crime than the beheading of Christians. I realize that people really don't understand the dangers of Islam. Islam is not just a religion. It is a political movement that wants domination in the world. Now how does that differ from the Bible? In a lot of ways. First of all, the salvation that's talked about in the Bible is significantly different than domination by a, by a particular group. All right? The significant difference is the salvation that is offered in the Bible as compared to the domination that is forced on you in the Quran. I, I'm a historian. I've studied the scriptures, I've studied the historical context in the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, and I understand that they are not the infallible word of God like so many Christians would like to have you believe, and Jews for that matter. There are many problems. But overall, the overarching principle in the Bible is salvation loving kindness. Yes, you do suffer when you do the wrong things, but it's not a commandment that you must believe. It's more of a conversion of the heart, the awe of discovery of a spiritual truth in a system of liberty, not force. That's the overarching principle throughout the scriptures. Yes, in the Bible it does say in Isaiah, that the Lord shall make an end to all nations and that all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of Christ and God. I understand that. But it's the way that it comes about. The requirements of the adherence of that faith. How they act that's so different. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I think most people have a, a pretty good grasp of that. What's important today, the purpose of this video is kind of a an addendum to my last one about what our, our military is aiding and abetting in the world, the evil that it's aiding and abetting in reality, the whole entire military industrial complex. And part of the tool that it's using is this situation with Islam. And I'm not going to go through a whole history of that, I just want to say a few important things. First of all, Islam appeared on the scene in about 600 AD. It was brought about through purportedly Muhammad the prophet. Whatever Muhammad stood for and what he did, that religion that, that, that he did then is not the religion today. And There will be people that will argue that day in and day out, but that is the way things progress in all situations. There's always a divergence. And proof of that in the, the Islamic religion is the, the disagreement. Indeed, the blood feud between the Shiites and the Sunnis, between those that believe that the leadership of the, of the Islamic um, political movement and religion should fall either in the hands of the, the relatives of Muhammad or basically his right-hand man, who wasn't a relative. That's, that's, that's the whole argument. So we see this rift right from the beginning. Now, I mentioned in, in the Santilli show the other night uh, satanic verses by uh, Salman Rushdie. And the important thing to understand about that is that it shows that Muhammad had a side that, and, and there, there are disagreements over whether what he said about this vision he had with the, with the three female spirits uh, that were actually a part of God's organization, uh, even maybe a part of God, the, the, what they told him was actually from Satan. Uh, frankly, I found it to be not that myself, but, but that's the basic concept because of the way uh, Islamic people look at Allah and about God in general. Salman Rushdie talked about those verses and the fact that they were written by Muhammad. The point of me bringing that up is, is again, there's this rift in the religion that our, us Christians don't have anything to do with. Okay, So there's a problem in Islam already. I want to get back to this main thing because it is so important. The main thing being that it's not just a religion. It's not just, if it is at all, 
a spiritual system. It is a political movement that requires its adherents, its followers, to do three things. Admit that Allah is God, that Muhammad is his prophet. That's a requirement. And thirdly, that it will take over and rule the entire earth, if not, in the end, the entire universe. Philosophically, God does rule the entire universe. But how does this get brought about? In Islam, they'll, they'll say, well, no, you lose something when you, when you translate from the English or from the Arabic to the English. Look, I've picked up Qurans from Muslims who have handed me at different events. So you Muslims, you Islamic followers, you give these things to us anyway. And, and if, you, if anyone reads these things closely, you see the difference. Islam is an enemy of all mankind. Just like the criminals in D.C. are the enemy of all mankind. And those two forces are using each other. And I could draw in you know, a bunch of other stuff too, but that's the basics at this point. So, what Islam says is a lot of good stuff. You know, oh, you know, don't steal from your neighbor. Uh, you know, believe how good Abraham was and, and, and all the good things he did. He, they talk about Moses. He, Muhammad in, in, in the Quran even talks about Jesus, a virgin birth. Let me point out to you what Muhammad was doing. Or if not Muhammad, his followers after him to, to make, to, to do some architecture in a, in a religion, in a philosophical, political movement to gain control in the world. They took the best things that they thought that they saw in Judaism and the best things that they thought they saw in Christianity and combined them, thinking that in that way they could bring everybody under the Islamic umbrella. That's what happened in the book of the Quran and in, in the Islamic religion. If not an intention by Muhammad himself, that was the end result. Okay? It is a religion of force. Yes, it says, oh, you need to do these nice things and all of that, but 90% of it where it says that is to lull you into a state of security where you don't look at the rest of it. I'm going to quote one passage up here for you Islamic people that are listening to this because this is out of your Quran. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of deep talk about this, but let me quote this to you. God will not force any soul beyond its capacity. Remember that. Because no matter how much you apologize for what's going on in the Middle East today, or what they intend to do to any non-believer, infidel if you like, they are not abiding by that. Unless you think beyond its capacity means, well, if they don't make it, then they deserve death. And that's the end of their capacity. That's the only way you can get by with what's going on today. I understand that jihad does mean a struggle of sorts, but it also means not really holy war, but physical combat, almost. Okay? So I do understand it. And you can apply jihad to a lot of things. You know, struggling with your own heart to be better. You know, those kinds of things. I understand that. But when it is used in telling people that they either have to accept Allah and your interpretation of Allah and accepting Muhammad as a prophet and the law of the Quran, and if they don't do so, they have three choices. And what are those three choices? Pay a tax. That's manipulation. That's force. Go live somewhere else but you want to take over the whole earth, domination. So eventually there will be no other place to go under that paradigm. And three, death. That's it. Those are the three choices you have in your own Quran. Okay, you people in the United States of America and in Eastern Europe, you do not understand this. And if your leaders do, they're not telling you the truth. Do I want to coexist with the Muslims? Do I want to allow them to have their freedom of religion, their freedom of spiritual systems? Of course I do. But their freedom is limited by the perfect law of liberty. It has to stop at my nose. Now, in the first century, it is true that the early Christians were Sicarii. They were assassins. They actually went after the Roman Empire. But it wasn't to instill 
their values, their culture on foreign nations. It was to get Rome out. That's not the case with Islam. Islam wants to dominate the entire world, and it will kill you if you don't submit to it. And quickly, I have to insert here that the Quran is very similar in some of its attributes. I'm using that term probably incorrectly, but very similar to the Jewish Talmud. The Talmud is what they really worship, the Jews now, especially the ones ruling uh, Israel, the supposed state of Israel. The Torah and the Tanakh uh, are kind of side notes. The Talmud is what they, they, they actually follow. And the Talmud has some, some good things and some really horrible things, which I'm not going to go into right now. Very similar to the Quran. As a matter of fact, it's very likely that Muhammad got some of his ideas on how to approach the Quran, or again, those that followed him, from how the Talmud was put together and what it says. Just another note to show you that I'm not here because I think Israel is the great panacea for the last days, at least not that nation state of Israel. But I do understand why, it, why Israel does not trust any Islamic country too close to its borders. The question is, why then have they allied with Saudi Arabia, some of the worst in the Islamic world? So, the bottom line here is this. The United States, the military industrial complex, intelligence complex, all of that has found something that they can use for perpetual warfare. And even though it started back in around 600 AD to morph into what it is today, or just to be carried through, starting in about the, the First World War with the whole story of T.E. Lawrence, and the Lawrence of Arabia, and then the dividing up of the Arab world into all these countries, we had set up a system by the demons in DC and the demons in Europe, supposed leaders, to cause a situation that would bring about perpetual warfare. Order out of chaos, that same old thing. Not peace, mind you. Not peace. So now what we have now is a situation where Islam has gone crazy. By the very words in the Quran, there is no such thing as a moderate Muslim, whatever that means. Okay, whatever it means by the people that invented this, it does not mean that they will allow you to live if you do not accept their religion and their political order. So now, Americans and Eastern Europeans, actually everybody in Europe, you're going to have to decide. Your leaders are taking you down a road, forcing you to accept people into your, into your countries under the pretense that they're refugees from a war which, as a matter of fact, the people in D.C. started. And in Europe, started. So in that regard, yeah, oh, yeah, there, there is some responsibility. But not to bring somebody who wants your death and destruction into your country. If they need aid, Develop a place somewhere in the Middle East and send it to them there. Islam is the enemy of mankind. Islam is the, is the satanic concept that was fought against by God in the beginning, where he wanted us to have free agency. Islam is a religion, is a political system that if you do not give it your complete and undying allegiance, they will kill you. That's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Couched in very nice, wonderful terms about how you should treat your fellow man, but when it comes to accepting Islam, again, you go back to those three choices, and there are no others. Domination is the end game over your body, mind, and soul. And they've shown that in what they've done to the Christians in Syria, Iraq, Libya, etc. Out here.